A Landowner's Guide to Coastal Protection. The Landowner's Guide to Coastal Protection offers straightforward advice on how coastal communities can assess coastal hazards and reduce risk. The guide is written specifically to help people in the Marshall Islands make informed development choices. However, the approach applies to any coastal settlement where waves, wind, and water converge to impact homes, livelihoods, and safety. The guide resulted from numerous visits to communities in need of options. The core message is that in order to manage any dynamic shoreline, it is important to consider the natural processes involved. Working with nature will prove much more successful than working against nature. Planning for protection. The guide recommends five key steps for deciding what to do. Identify what needs protecting. Understand the energy level of your shoreline. Assess your particular coastal setting. Identify potential protection measures. Consider both the good and the bad impacts of protection as a community working together. Step one, identify what you think needs protecting on the shore. Start by thinking about what needs protection in your community. Is it houses, the road, a school, a garden, park, or the natural character of your coast? Highly developed shorelines may require different methods than open spaces that are relatively undisturbed. Step two, understand the energy level of your shoreline. Shoreline energy conditions narrow the suitable shore protection options and designs for your coast. Lagoon shorelines are generally calmer. That is, they have lower energy, but can still be exposed to locally generated waves that cause erosion. Oceanside shorelines are higher energy because they are exposed to larger and more powerful waves and storm surge. Step three, Assess how your coastal setting functions before deciding that you have an erosion problem. Observe your beach. Start by making some common sense observations about your situation in terms of erosion, sedimentation, and flooding. Physical processes such as wind, waves, tides, and sea level influence biological processes and physical movement of sediment. These processes act together in atolls to create tropical reef ecosystems, which in turn generate sediment and buffer the shore from wave energy. The movement of sediment is a key coastal process that can produce new sandbars, beaches, or islands within the atoll or other coastal shoreline. How is your shoreline shaped by normal conditions with no significant storm waves? During times with larger waves, is sediment washing off of your beach? Does it go offshore or down the beach? Has the natural shoreline protection offered by coral reefs or wetlands been compromised? Is erosion ongoing and likely to continue? Or has the cause of the erosion ended or been removed? Compare the shape of the original and storm affected beach to create a beach storm profile. Does most of the sediment normally return and rebuild the original pre-storm beach? This is the natural way a shoreline responds to dynamic conditions, which change with rising sea level and storm frequency and intensity. Recognize erosion. Erosion occurs when waves or wind move sediment offshore or alongshore. During storms, eroded shorelines may have a severe loss of sediment and a steep scoured profile. They may take a very long time to return to their previous condition, depending on the energy level and the sediment supply. Monitor the shoreline. Monitoring the shoreline over time can help you understand long-term trends. Collecting photographs over time, especially after storms, helps to understand the changes. You can monitor the shore by taking basic measurements of the profile or simply measuring the beach width from a stable landmark. Seek help from local researchers or government agencies to set up a monitoring program. Step four, choose a protection method. Protection of existing beach ridges, reefs, wetlands, and adjacent habitats that shelter and stabilize shorelines is the first line of action. These areas must be preserved from harmful uses such as overharvesting of mangroves and sand mining. Additional measures may be necessary in areas with severe ongoing erosion. 
Non-structural solutions include moving back from eroded areas, maintaining vegetation to buffer waves, or nourishing beaches with additional sand. In selected places, allowing the shoreline to be a dynamic, healthy, undeveloped beach may be the best protection for the backshore and also provides a place for recreation or a refuge for flora and fauna. Structural coastal protection options include seawalls, revetments, groins, and breakwaters. Some designs can be highly effective at protecting assets. However, if they are improvised or inappropriate, they are likely to fail over time, increasing the risk of further erosion. The key to protecting assets is to select appropriate methods and design for that specific site. The guidebook contains a useful table that can help your community assess different options. The best protection may come through a combination of methods. Non-structural protection options. Vegetated buffers. Planting salt-resistant vegetation on low energy shorelines can be an effective way to buffer wave and wind energy. Dense shrubs can help stabilize and build sandy shorelines. Mature mangrove stands may reduce wave energy in some atoll shorelines. Vegetated areas have additional benefits to fisheries, enhance bird habitat, and support fruit like pandanus. Beach nourishment. Beach nourishment can help maintain a sandy beach system. The challenge is finding sustainably sourced sediment to add to the beach that will not aggravate the problem elsewhere. Nourishment works by increasing beach width and dune height that reduce wave energy. Nourished material is not suitable on high energy shorelines where it will be quickly eroded. Community adaptation and managed retreat. Adaptation is making changes to accommodate the conditions and may be the best option if flooding frequency and erosion are increasing or if protecting property in place is not viable. One way to adapt is to retreat from the coast by moving up or moving back and agreeing to set back distances from the shoreline for all new construction. Consider raising floor levels of structures at least one meter by using stilts or pilings to make the building contents less vulnerable to coastal flooding. Moving back or constructing buildings and roads further from the shoreline reduces impact. Higher wave energy and erosion requires a larger distance. Knowing where the shoreline was in the past helps you understand how much erosion may occur in the future. Structural protection options. In some situations, non-structural protection may simply not provide the level of protection needed and relocation may not be possible. The benefits from structural protection may justify the high cost of installation. Keep in mind that the impacts of a seawall or breakwater can actually cause erosion and make problems worse if not designed and built correctly. Seawalls. Seawalls are self-supporting hard structures that are built parallel to the shoreline that reflect wave energy away from the shore. They can be built using concrete, concrete block, or wire gabion baskets filled with rocks. Building a seawall in front of your property might protect your land. However, this approach often causes erosion problems for your neighbors and the beach in front of your property. Revetments. Revetments are generally constructed by piling large rocks or gabion baskets to form sloping armor on the shoreline. A properly built revetment will reduce wave energy. If the rocks are too small for larger waves, they may become a safety concern during a storm. As with seawalls, revetments can have major impacts on adjacent land. Groins. Groins are rock walls built perpendicular to the shore. A series of groins can trap sediment to increase beach volume and width. However, trapping sediment from moving along shore also means that groins stop sediment from reaching other areas, ultimately causing erosion elsewhere. Breakwaters. Breakwaters are offshore structures designed to dissipate wave energy before reaching the shoreline. Large ones are often built to protect high-value sites such as ports. A series of smaller ones strategically placed in intertidal or shallow subtidal areas are an effective alternative to more costly and potentially environmentally damaging seawalls and revetments. A breakwater needs to be high enough to break incoming waves. Most erosion is by storm waves at high tide. The design should focus on this. Breakwaters often change the wave climate and configuration of the shoreline. 
Increasing beach width behind the breakwater can be accompanied by erosion on either side. Step 5. Communities need to work together to avoid doing more harm than good. Most shore protection methods are best suited to a scale greater than one household or property. Therefore, it is best to work together as a community to provide effective protection to all properties. If each property on the beachfront works separately with different methods, erosion issues may continue or become worse between disconnected structures. Careful planning, design, and implementation are key for effective coastal protection. Poorly planned protection can cause more harm than good. Planning for successful coastal protection. Identify what needs protecting, understand the energy level of your shoreline, assess your particular coastal setting, choose protection measures, consider the impacts of protection as a community. When you do make decisions on shore protection, monitor how effective the solution is at providing protection and assess any changes to adjacent properties and to the natural environment. Take the lessons learned and use them in future coastal protection approaches. The Landowner's Guide to Coastal Protection has more information on how to understand your shore and make good protection choices.